Now you talk about terror. I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Hi, I'm Chris Hedges. Welcome to Days of Revolt. Today we're going to be speaking with Leo Ponich, the author with Sam Gindin of The Making of Global Capitalism, uh, the role of the state, and in particular the American state, in creating a new form of empire uh, that denies that it is empire or is a form of imperialism. Thank you, Leo. Good to be here, Chris. So let's begin with this concept which you lay out in the book, which I think is correct, that, uh, and I'm going to quote Harold Innes, 1948, which you quote in the book, American imperialism has been made plausible and attractive in part by the insistence that it is not imperialistic. And that is a fundamental theme of your book, and maybe you can explain how that happened. It uh, goes all the way back, I guess, to the American Revolution, which was an anti-imperial revolution. Um, and uh, the United States, therefore, conceived itself uh, politically and culturally uh, as uh, a non-imperial force while engaging in imperial behavior. Especially to Native Americans. Especially on this continent, initially. And then, as the most dynamic of modern capitalisms on the face of the earth developed within the United States, very much encouraged by the American state uh, at various points of the 19th century, it was never a laissez-faire state. It was always a highly interventionist well, state. Well, you talk about the tariffs, you know, which essentially built walls that allowed America to become an industrial giant. Yes, uh, and through many other direct interventions, the building of infrastructure as, at public expense and yeah. often as public projects. Um, they're selling it off now. They're selling some of it <laughs> off or they're the, letting some of it. Including the U.S. Post Office. <laughs> That's right. Or they're letting a lot of <laughs> it atrophy. Not funny, actually, but no. Yeah, and they're letting a lot of it atrophy. Um, so, uh, the, the, it, it isn't a formal empire. Uh, the United States, even at let, Teddy let, Roosevelt's time. Let, let, let me just time, stop you there. By formal empire, you mean in terms of the physical occupation, uh, like King Leopold in the Congo kind of empire, the British in India. Yeah, although Argentina and eventually the white dominions like my own country, Canada, uh, had a different status than India as a colony, uh, despite the development of you know, similar types of companies within the two of them. Uh, Argentina, after uh, the breakaway from Spain, and Canada, in its movement from colony to independent state, to dominion, right. as they were called, um, uh, remained uh, very much within the uh, orbit of the British state, but as independent states. Right. And that, has, that became the model uh, for how the American empire evolved. Uh, people who thought that Teddy Roosevelt was about creating colonies, that what was happening between 1998 and 1902 was America turning itself into a formal empire. That proved to be the exception, much more than the rule. Uh, and, and that's not to say that independent states uh, don't exist within the panoply of this informal American empire. Canadians know very well the extent to which in substantive terms we've moved from having been a colony to an independent dominion to a colony in substantive terms, if not in formal terms, of, of, the, of the American empire. Yes, of course. Um, when you talk about the uh, effectiveness of American imperialism, um, you highlight the fact that part of the reason it's so effective is because it has been able to be largely invisible, and it has been invisible, you point out, through, I think, two mechanisms. One, that it trains the elites in other countries in order to manage uh, 
affairs on behalf of uh, American imperialism. Uh, and also because it disseminates through popular media uh, images of America that in essence, I'm not sure you use this word exactly, indoctrinate or brainwash a population into allowing them to believe that America is instilled with values that in fact it doesn't have. The ability of imperialistic forces to supposedly give these values to the countries they dominate. I mean, that is a kind of raison d'etre for economic and even military intervention, as we saw in Iraq, in planning democracy in Baghdad and letting it spread out across the Middle East, or going into Afghanistan to liberate the women of Afghanistan. That, as somebody who spent 20 years on the outer edges of empire, is a lie. It depends how cynical you think they are, and, and I think it varies depending on uh, the administration in question, and indeed different personnel inside each administration. Going back to the types of interventions we were discussing under Teddy Roosevelt, there were some people who quite genuinely and naively believed that by supporting uh, reactionary forces against rebellions in Central America, they nevertheless could establish a liberal democracy in those countries. And they ended up getting in bed with and in cahoots with extremely reactionary and conservative forces that they would have preferred would you know, become like the United States, but were unable to make them do so. The imperial power, and the Romans discovered this first of all, of course, is not absolute. And even when the Americans become a very powerful social and political force inside other countries, their ability to make those countries into a image of the United States, which as they may na naively have thought they were going to do, has always been limited. Well, Graham Greene kind of eviscerated this kind of American, and I think it does break down between those who are very cynical, and for lack of a better word, those who are very stupid. Uh, and we <laughs> saw a lot of stupid people, Wolfowitz, yeah. Cheney, Pearl, and others, uh, who know nothing about the Middle East, who know nothing about the instrument of war, uh, and certainly knew nothing about the culture and history uh, of Iraq yeah. uh, believe that they could implant this very naive vision uh, and, and, and what always happens in cases like that is rivers of blood. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I think that the American empire is most powerful actually, not in those regions of the world in which it has intervened militarily, uh, it, at least in recent decades. It's more powerful in those regions of the world that have become, if I may use the word, Canadianized. Mm -hmm. That is, where American capital has penetrated, where economic relations are extremely deep, where American multinational corporations are a social force inside those countries. Uh, and therefore, I think the strongest linkages are with the former old imperial countries of Europe. Oh, Germany, uh, you write a lot about Germany. And Germany represents that. So, you know, you see the mess in Iran. Uh, or Iraq, etc. Uh, I mean, Iran with the Shah back in the 70s and Iraq uh, in, in the current millennium. Um, but, but the strongest linkages of empire are those amongst the advanced capitalist states, right. which also operate under the rubric of the American Treasury, the Federal Reserve, etc. Nevertheless, even there, as you see with Germany's behavior vis-a-vis -vis Greece, which the American administration, the Treasury, wouldn't have wanted, uh, they aren't able to give them orders. It, it's, you know, that, that does show you the relative autonomy that states within an informal empire have as compared to ones that are subjected militarily, uh, as some countries are. Well, you write a lot about, you know, the, the uh, kind of collapse because of the war of European economies after World War II and the recreation uh, with, you know, the help of the American labor movement, the AFL-CIO, which was going over there uh, working on behalf of the CIA to break what they deemed communist or leftist or socialist unions. Uh, and much of the book, I think, makes a very strong argument that, uh, especially after World War II, we recreated economic political systems in our own image, yeah. which wasn't complete, you know, as you point out correctly, vis-a-vis -vis Greece, does not mean that we had iron control, but they work within those imperialistic, capitalist, 
globalist parameters. That's right. Uh, the difference is that even the Germans, who are so central to contemporary global capitalism and especially to European capitalism, have never taken the responsibility upon themselves that the Americans did, tried to do with, with Wilson at the end of World War I, but then effectively did. Uh, during the course of World War II, have never taken responsibility on themselves for managing a global capitalism and for all of the headaches that that involves uh, in, in terms of uh, the difficulties and contradictions of that. Uh, the Germans have primarily in Europe tried to ensure that the international institutions are replicas of the old German central bank the Bundesbank, and uh, they primarily oriented the Euro, let us say, to play the kind of role that uh, the Deutschmark used to play. They're mainly concerned, in other words, with the competitiveness and status of the German economy. The Americans have carried a burden. All right. empires carry a burden. And their burden has been, and it's the, an enormous headache, and they screw it up often, as Iraq shows. Uh, of trying to manage a global capitalism. Uh, and, and the German state doesn't do that. It's an enormous difference. Right. Well, let's not feel too sorry for the Americans. They killed three million Vietnamese and one million Iraqis. The responsibilities of power uh, often go with very, dirt, very, very dirty hands. Right. I'm not sure I'd use the word responsibility. Uh, I, think, I think we have to see it that way. Uh, I think we do have to. I know a lot of the left doesn't like to see it that way. But I think it's more a structural thing. Uh, and I think if you and I were dropped into being head of the Federal Reserve uh, without having the type of political forces behind us that could allow us to transform its utter nature, we wouldn't be behaving all that differently than uh, the current chair of the, of the Federal Reserve. Right. Well, they, Unfortunately. they would never ask me to come to the or Federal me. Reserve. So, yeah, um, exactly. I mean, capitalism in America has changed. Uh, you know, from the old the Fordism, yes. the Rockefellers, the Carnegie, which produced, manufactured, broke uh, labor unions, as you correctly highlight in your book, broke our radical movements, and it's shifted into the hands of financiers, into insurance, into real estate, who now virtually control the global economy uh, at the expense of industrial capitalism, and often, I would argue, at the expense of governments. Um, and I, I wouldn't. I know you wouldn't. Uh, I, I don't think that there's a divorce and an antagonism between industrial and financial capital. Uh, I think they're highly integrated. Uh, I think that finance performs an absolutely crucial function for multinational industrial corporations. Uh, an essential one in terms of the productive networks around the globe. Uh, it isn't just speculation, although it is speculation, it isn't just speculation finance. Moreover, I think it isn't at the expense of states. Uh, I think that... Uh, well, let me just ask, I mean, they're hoarding, you know, how many trillions of dollars overseas to escape taxation? Well, whether that's industrial capital or right, financial capital. Right, but it is at the expense of states. And, and, it, it, and, and, and the essentially the migration of manufacturing, first over the border with NAFTA to Mexico, Vietnam, Bangladesh, uh, where people are earning 22 cents an hour. A global uh, capitalism is saying if you want to be competitive on a global marketplace, you have to be a serf. And we're seeing that, uh, I mean, you just look at the whole the nationalization of GM, the renegotiating of contracts, the uh, the diminishing of uh, the power of well, labor. You're using states States. in an idealistic way, I think. Uh, if you understand that, as I think they are, uh, that states are the handmaidens of capital, if one abandons this mistaken conception that comes from, from neoclassical economics, then uh, one doesn't have this notion that there's an opposition between them. Uh, of course, uh, where you have democracies, where working classes uh, have won the right to vote, uh, that does at least create a tendency uh, on the part of states to be sensitive to presenting themselves uh, 
in ways that uh, look democratic uh, and introducing the type of policies that bind working classes more deeply to the capitalist state. Sometimes that involves dis redistribution, sometimes it involves benefits to them, but uh, it isn't. So I, you know, you point out in your book that, that the American working class in particular was bought off. That, and you quote from, I think it's a letter that Roosevelt wrote, that in essence says, um, you know, to the oligarchic elite, um, you know, I'm kind of paraphrasing, you better give up some of your money uh, or we're going to get a revolution and you're going to lose all of your money. I mean, he yeah. spoke, he used that word revolution. Yeah. And, and so that the whole reforms of the New Deal were not, and I, I don't argue with you here, some kind of beneficence on the part of, and Roosevelt came out of the oligarchic class because of their good heartedness or because they cared about the suffering, but because of the pressure of radical movements uh, that have now have been largely destroyed, but that arose with the breakdown of capitalism. It, 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 that's right, but it also happens when derivatives are used to secure mortgages for black Americans who have been excluded from the New Deal housing reforms for most of the era up to right. the 1990s. There too, politicians encourage the development of derivative markets. And we're talking about democratic politicians right. now. This occurred more in the Clinton era right. than any other uh, initially. Uh, and they took pride in the fact that capitalists around the world were investing in the derivative mortgage markets in the United States and this was allowing the black poor of Cleveland uh, to buy right. houses. And that too was represented as meeting democratic pressures. Right, but until they were repossessed and there were foreclosures which the banks and financial firms like Goldman Sachs knew were coming. It was a scam. Of course. So, I mean, the idea that uh, at that point, I think it's an evidence of a breakdown of democracy, Clinton being the kind of poster child for this, where they spoke in that traditional feel your pain language uh, and concern for the poor and the underclass and the working class, uh, and yet ran through or allowed to go through a series of uh, policies that were completely predatory on terms of the poor. I think that neither politicians uh, nor businessmen think in such long-run terms. I think insofar as uh, those derivative mortgage markets were growing uh, and were growing for five, ten years, that's the terms that they think in. Uh, yes, uh, I think you're right that all of them, none of them, are, take for a moment seriously the notions of neoclassical economists about market equilibrium. They all know that crises happen. They expect them to happen. They just hope they aren't going to happen on right, their but, watch. But Leo, you know, Goldman Sachs did think in the long term and that it bet against those derivatives and subprime mortgages through AIG. It Eventually. Knew, they knew they were going to collapse. Well, of course, derivatives are all about counter hedging, and Goldman Sachs was smart enough to counter hedge earlier. And, and for heaven's sake, they had done it during the 19. 70, when Goldman Sachs wasn't a major player, they had done it during the 1970s commercial paper crisis where they were selling off commercial paper to municipalities and universities right. knowing that Penn right. State was going to go bankrupt. Right, well there's a word for that, it's called fraud. Yeah, uh, and they, you know, they, pay off some, they paid off some fines, they were in court in the 1970s, well, etc. I mean, you know, they, the LIBOR, they fix the, for five years they fix the world currency rates, they make 80 plus billion dollars profit and they pay a nine billion dollar fine. That's not a bad business. Well, there's always been a phenomenon of double agents in the American political system. Corporate lawyers who have worked for the major corporations, taught them how to get around regulations, gone into the state, right. and then written the regulations well, you make that, that they told you them make to get that around. point in the book. That yeah, is a kind of symbiotic, incestuous relationship where uh, the very people who are gaming the system then go into the system. Uh, and I think in the book you, you actually say that they go into the system to essentially fight uh, you know, the, the, the entities that they come out of. I, I'm not sure I would agree with that. I and mean, you can look at Liz Fowler, uh, the person who wrote the disastrous for-profit health care bill in the United States known as Obamacare, where she worked on, I think these people work on behalf of 
uh, you, you know, essentially writing regulations into a kind of a two-tiered system where corporations like Goldman Sachs uh, can write laws and regulations that allow them to carry out fraud. Uh, and then these people like Fowler fun are funneled right back into the system uh, uh, and amply rewarded for their work. Yes, but uh, the private health agencies don't have to worry about the types of popular pressures that produce this ersatz public health system in the United States. So when she's brought in, she's brought in to do something that she doesn't have to do when she's working for these private corporations. Similarly, when Robert Rubin leaves Goldman Sachs and becomes uh, uh, secretary treasurer, he is performing a, a function that is about reproducing Goldman Sachs right. and reproducing Without Wall Street, right. but nevertheless using his knowledge to engage in the management of global capitalism, which is an entirely different set of responsibilities than he occupies with Goldman Sachs. And that often involves him calling in the principles of Wall Street and telling them to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do and which they do in order to reproduce the system, but wouldn't do it on their own. Right, but if there's a single figure who's, you know, if we had to pick one responsible for the 2008 meltdown, it's Robert Rubin. Yes, I mean... So, I mean, it's not knowledge, it's idiocy. Well, is it idiocy? What do you mean? American capitalism continues to thrive in relative terms. Uh, well, because it loots the U.S. Treasury to the tune of trillions of dollars. Sure. And because the Fed gives it virtually 0% interest rate on money. Sure. But that's not capitalism, it's extortion. No, well, if you want to call it uh, extortion, it's not merely extortion, it's accumulation. Uh, I don't see how it's extortion insofar as the state legalizes this. Uh, and and uh, It's extortion of the taxpayer because the average citizen gets austerity rammed down their throat to pay for it. And the average citizen for a period, and for a long period, was able to thrive uh, on financial markets. I mean, the point is we are all integrated into this system. We are all dependent on it. Uh, you know, had radical journalists like Michael Moore gotten their way and, and let Wall Street collapse instead of being bailed out by the TARP program, which, you know, of course, is, was designed to save the banks, who would have suffered most the point is that we are all dependent yeah, on why, you know, why we need to be really radical in trying to change this system is precisely because we need to recognize the extent to which we are all embedded right, in it. Right, but, but there was an alternative to, to bailing out the banks, and it wasn't letting it collapse. It was creating regional banks, capitalizing them at $10 billion, leveraging them 10 to 1, helping people deal with their mortgages, rather than giving this money to zombie banks. The, that, there was alternatives, and that was never discussed. Well, that would have involved, of course, and I've been advocating this for a very long time, turning uh, the American banking system, and above all, the principles of the American banking system, the big commercial investment banks, into public utilities. Well, that's what we should do. In, of course. And it isn't just a matter of creating a regional bank like the Bank of North Dakota. Where do they put their surpluses every night? They put them into Wall Street. Right. Uh, so it, 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 it's a matter of taking the whole system and nationalizing it. Right. Well, and, I, you know, and I think that's an old-fashioned term, in fact, because it does imply something that I would not like to imply about the type of state we would like to have. But it does involve turning them into democratic public utilities as part of a democratic economic planning system. Now for that, you need to change uh, not only the bourgeoisie, you need to change the way in which the working class is integrated into the system. The way even unemployed black people are integrated right. into the system and are so embedded in it, right. are so dependent on it. Right. For the for the house over their heads, right? Well, over the roof over their heads. The word for that is called socialism. Yeah, it's a word <laughs> called socialism, which we're both happy to and use. Now we agree. Thank you very much, Leo. <laughs> happy to talk to you, Chris. <laughs> and thank you for watching Days of Revolt. Had to eat out the watermelon patch.
and you know they put me in a shack. <laughs> 